Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Deanne Mazaki, State Representative for the 47th House District, and welcome. Um, tonight, we're going to go through a whole host of things. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of introductions about me. Deanna Wilkins, our York Township Assessor. Uh, Elmhurst is in York Township. Then we're going to just go through a um, little bit of information um, and do some, hopefully, questions and answers uh, when we get to the very end of the presentation. Um, if there is something that completely uh, jumps into your mind as we're going through, feel free to raise your hand, but we, we do try to have everything at the end so that we can, we, because hopefully we'll be able to answer some of the questions uh, that you have as we go through the entire presentation. Um, so I am Deanne Mazaki, your state representative. The 47th district is predominantly um, Elmhurst, Oak Brook, Oak Brook Terrace, Hinsdale, Clarendon Hills, Westmont, and a little bit of the surrounding areas as well. Um, I serve on a host of committees down in Springfield, including um, some that relate to your own property values, particularly the housing committee, as well as the Jude Civ committee, because anything relating to uh, claims that you may have uh, go through that committee. Um, one of the things that I was very happy to serve on was the Property Tax Relief Task Force. I'll tell you how that came out in the end. Um, unfortunately, because it was Springfield, the answer is not well. Um, but there are a whole host of things that we are working on down in Springfield to try to get some what I would call more sane public policy uh, here for Illinois, particularly that's going to help us here in the suburbs. Also with us today is Deanna Wilkins, who is our York Township Assessor. So here in um, Illinois, pretty much most of your assessing, your assessment process is done at what's called the township level. So if you're in Elmhurst, you are in York Township. If you are in uh, Oak Brook, part of you is York Township. Others are uh, Downers Grove Township. And then as you start going farther south, uh, Hinsdale in the district, Westmont, that's also Downers Grove Township as well. Uh, one of the things that hopefully everybody managed to pick up is there was a folder over at the table over here. If you didn't get one, pick, please go ahead and pick one up on the way out. Uh, we have some additional information for you to take home, not only uh, some information about how much uh, money you're actually sending down to Springfield and getting back, but also a property tax survey so that we can know exactly you know, how people are paying, uh, what you think um, is working for you, what isn't, what value are you or are you not getting out, and uh, that's one of the things that I actually use to try, these survey results are things I use to try to craft legislation uh, down in Springfield. Um, so there are a whole host of areas for reform. Uh, the biggest part that I always get complaints about is how we do school funding. So there again, uh, we'll, we'll get into a little bit of that. But again, give me some feedback in terms of what you're seeing on your property tax bill and what you think you're getting out of here in Elmhurst District 205. Um, one of the things then that I know is very important to our district residents is actually figuring out how do I get this assessed value on my property tax bill, what does it mean, and how does that relate to my actual property tax amount that I have to pay uh, once those lovely bills start coming in the mail. So with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Deanna Wilkins, our York Township Assessor, so she can take you through the assessment process and how numbers wind up on your property tax bill. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you so much for joining us. York Township, York Township consists of Elmhurst, Oak Brook, Oak Brook Terrace, Villa Park, Lombard, and we have a little bit of Downers Grove, um, Westmont, and Hinsdale. We are from 35th Street on the south-hand side, North Avenue on the north side, like 355 on the west, and 290 on the east. We have Oak Brook in Yorktown and our township also. We have 11 employees, and I'd like to acknowledge the people that are here tonight. We have Jerry, Fred, Julie, and Jennifer. So thank you for coming tonight and helping out. We have um, 46,000 parcels approximately and $21 billion worth of value. So we have a lot to do. We try to have the fair and most fair and equitable assessments as possible. If you ever have any questions, always feel free, to feel free to call our office or just look us up on the web at www.yorkassessor.com. Um, now I'm gonna turn you over to Jerry who's gonna give you the presentation. Thank you, Representative Mizaki. Thank you, Assessor Wilkins. Um, with the camera guy's permission, I'm gonna actually probably stand away from the mic. I tend to feel a little trapped behind a, a lectern. If you can't hear me, let me know. Um, I'm gonna go through my series, uh, our series slides and uh, as has been mentioned already, if we can have the questions at the end, uh, it'll give, uh, give us a chance to get through everything that we want you to have a chance to see first. Uh, the, the assessment process itself can be fairly confusing. Uh, the 
the main thrust of what we do is the valuation of property as opposed to the taxation of people or property. Uh, as it says on the screen, we're always valuing properties as of January 1st of the assessment year. That's our, our date for how we value property. We look at everything that's going on in the township uh, at that time. Property, uh, whether it's residential, commercial, industrial, any type of property, as it says there, valued by its use, utility, size, location. Uh, the improvements are valued by their condition as well. Uh, and by statute, we have to be at one third of market value, 33 and a third percent. And that's the median level of assessment that's mentioned there. There's, uh, the way we get there is through the use of what's called a sales ratio study. And we're always looking back three years to the date, from the date of value. Uh, we're here in 20, uh, 2022. We've been looking at sales that occurred in 2021, 2020, and 2019. We use that three-year sales uh, history as required by statute. And in an appreciating market, you're going to see assessments that will be behind that ratio study. Because again, we're always using it for three prior years. Just as we did a number of years ago when we had the declining market, we were always playing catch up to the market because we're using that prior three-year sales history. Uh, part of our job is to go out and we value, inspect and value all new construction, all construction in the township. And we're always looking at market trends. We're always paying attention to what's happening in the marketplace because it does give us the best indication of value. The three years rate, uh, three year ratio study that I mentioned, this is just a screen grab from one of them. Uh, it gives parcel numbers, the neighborhood that we picked, the property type, and then we look at the size of the property, the age it was constructed, sale price, and then we're always looking at where our level of assessment is. Again, trying to be at that one-third market. So our goal as we, as we look at assessments is to always mirror what's happening in the marketplace as best we can. Uh, we do our work in a four-year cycle. Uh, we're coming on to the general assessment year, 2023. This is the tax bills you'll pay in 2024. That general assessment year, as I said, it's done every four years. Uh, we define the general assessment year by the word all. Okay? We look at all of the properties in the, in the township, all real estate. Everybody, all properties receive a notice. Okay? It gets sent to you in the mail. And we also publish all of the assessments in your local newspapers. Uh, if, you're, uh, if you're in Oak Brook, that's going to be in the doings here in Elmhurst. Uh, the Elmhurst Press, I believe. Do they still have the press? Elmhurst Independent. The Elmhurst Independent. See, that's how far back I go, is the Elmhurst Press. I grew up in Elmhurst. So uh, everybody gets that notice uh, in 2023. Prior to that, the 2022 assessment, which is where we're at right now, uh, which will be for tax bills paid next year, uh, that one is, uh, this year is defined by the term only. Uh, we only value those properties that have had some change to them, additions that were made, uh, if sales information comes into the office that uh, the property is inappropriately assessed, we'll make those changes. We only publish those assessments that we, in the office, change. So it's not all 46,000 parcels, it's only those assessments that we in the office change. And we only mail to those properties that we make a change to the assessment. So 2023, everybody gets a notice. In 2022, it's only those properties that we would make a change. Uh, you'll notice the last bullet point, there's a 30-day window. The 30-day appeal period starts once we publish in the newspaper. Once those assessments are published in the newspaper, that's your 30-day notice in which to file the appeal. <clears throat> the next part of uh, this pr uh, presentation, we're going to go over some assessment facts. We're also going to talk about uh, the overview of the tax billing process, because that's really where the rubber hits the road for most property owners. We're going to do a tax rate comparison scenario. The idea is that you can see similar valued properties, but in different locations, they can have vastly different tax bills. Uh, Representative Mazaki touched on it already. We're also going to talk about where your tax dollars go, the ways that you can reduce your tax burden in terms of uh, exemptions that are available to you, and then also actually how to file that assessment appeal. Uh, first thing, as I mentioned before, our office, uh, the assessor's office doesn't really tax anybody. Our job is, is uh, the primary function of our job is to value the real estate in the jurisdiction. The taxing bodies that are listed on your tax bill, 
Uh, and the township is one of them. Those taxing bodies are the people who ask for your dollars. And how much they ask for will directly impact your tax bill. The county's, uh, county clerk's job, once we do our work and once the taxing bodies do their work, the county clerk is the one that determines the rate, what you'll uh, eventually pay on your tax bill. And while taxes are based in part on the assessed value, uh, the, the big driver of taxes, of course, is the rate and the process of how those taxing bodies get their dollars. This is a, a short, simple pictograph of it. Uh, what we do is right here, the total assessed value of the property. That's our job in the assessor's office, but the taxing bodies, that's the levy. How much do they need to operate? Everything from the city of Elmhurst, the county, the township, the school districts, and so forth, they all have a budget. When we do our job, we don't know what their budget is. We can't know. Uh, when the taxing bodies are setting their levies, they don't know what we do. That separation is there so that it, it can't be influenced. Uh, the levy is divided by how much value we have in the township, and that gives the tax rate. And that tax rate is what's multiplied by uh, your assessed value, less any exemptions. And like it says there, that's why the rate matters. Uh, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to go through a small uh, comparison. We're going to look at a home that has a value of $450,000, and we're going to look at that home's tax bill in the various jurisdictions here in the township. Uh, we're going to look at Oak Brook, Downers Grove, Oak Brook Terrace, Elmhurst, Villa Park, and Lombard. Uh, again, all of these homes would have a hypothetical value of $450,000, but they will have vastly different tax bill amounts because of where they're located. <clears throat> Oak Brook in, in York Township, Oak Brook has the lowest tax rate of any of the jurisdictions that we have in the township. Uh, in this instance here, uh, as an example, Oak Brook's tax rate is about $3.67 for every $100 of value. Okay, now if you go all the way down here to Lombard, which is the highest rate, they're almost $8 per 100 of assessed value. That's a significant difference. Again, depending on where the property is located. These properties all have the same market value and as such the same assessed value, but with the different rates, you can see a difference in a tax bill from almost $5,300 to almost $11,000. Okay? And that is based on where the property is located, even though the values would be the same. So it can be pretty stunning. And that's also why it's important to know where these tax dollars go. <clears throat> As what we talked about already, this is the, the most recent infographic that we have. About 73.5% of your tax dollars go to your schools. And okay, this is everything from uh, your local grade schools on up through the community colleges. Uh, here in Elmhurst, you've got a unit school district, but in other towns, they have a grade school district, high school district, and so forth. Uh, but again, the lion's share of your tax bill goes to those uh, to the schools, uh, with the rest of those taxing bodies <coughs> filling that out. So when we see that, we can say, you know what, this is where the bulk of my tax bill goes to. And it gives us the opportunity as valuation professionals, that's when we start to say that school districts matter to value. And it always has. <clears throat> so how can you reduce your tax burden? You saw the couple slides ago, when the tax bill went everywhere from about $5,000 all the way up to almost $11,000. Well, how can you reduce your tax burden? The first one we're going to talk to is exemptions. Uh, the exemptions are a set amount deducted from the assessed value. Not your tax bill, but the assessed value of the property. And before they, they multiply that assessment by the tax rate, it gives us a chance to take some money off from the assessment. Uh, ownership limitations do apply. We're going to talk about some of the different ones that we have. The most predominant one is the residential exemption or the general homestead exemption. We'll talk about the home improvement exemption. We'll talk about a couple of different senior exemptions, and then I'll show a brief slide with some of the other exemptions that are available to you. And remember, these are deductions from assessed value, not from tax dollars. The first one we'll talk about is the residential exemption. If you own and occupy your property, you're eligible for the residential exemption. Uh, for the 2022 assessment year, that exemption was $6,000 in assessed value. The 2023 assessment year, taxes payable in 24, that'll go up to $8,000. So 
so there will be additional savings there as well. You do have to own and occupy the property. As I said, it has to be your primary residence also. And you have to own and uh, occupy it on January 1st of the assessment year. The next exemption that we have is what's called the home improvement exemption. Uh, this is the second most common type of exemption after senior exemptions. And this is the opportunity if you make some sort of improvement to your home, you can take advantage of the exemption uh, to save some tax dollars on it. Uh, it is up to $25,000 in assessed value, which is $75,000 in market value. It does require that you have taken out a building permit for the work to be done. Uh, and as I said, that is assessed value. And some of the examples of why you might get a uh, home improvement exemption are listed there. Additions, adding a bath, if you put out a room like a three season porch, something along those lines. If value is added because of that improvement, you can take advantage of the exemption. Uh, just like the residential exemption, the home improvement exemption is automatic. Uh, that's why it requires that building permit. Um, it gives us the, uh, the ability to go ahead and whatever value we would increase up to the $25,000 in assessed value to exempt that for you. It does last for four years. A little bit of history for you. Back when the, the residential exemption was first instituted, the typical home improvement loan was four years. So the legislature at the time said, well, you know what, if we're going to take four years to pay back the loan, we'll make the exemption last four years. And that has lasted to this day. So at the end of that four-year period, we put the value back on the assessment. Uh, it, again, it gives you an opportunity to save a little bit of money for the first four years. Uh, the next uh, point there is homeowner responsibilities. This is particularly if you're a new buyer. Uh, many times we will hear from buyers that they didn't know that a property had a home improvement exemption. That would be one of the questions you'd want to ask or if you're considering selling, making sure that your buyer knows that it either has a home improvement exemption or it's going to be expired. Uh, always ask, make sure that your buyers know. You'll want to know that at the end of that four-year period, the assessment will be going up. Uh, the last thing there, some of the things that we don't assess for are what we would call general repair and maintenance items. A new roof, new windows, uh, if you're upgrading your central air conditioning system. These are all things that are going to add value to your, mar to your market value, but we don't assess for them, so you can't take the exemption for them. Because we don't add value, so that you wouldn't be eligible for the exemption on it. Those are considered normal repairs and maintenance out of, uh, over the property's lifespan. If you're over 65, one of the other exemptions that you can take advantage of is the standard senior exemption. This one is age-based. Uh, as long as you're 65 years of age or older, as of January 1st of the assessment year, you can get the $5,000 senior exemption. That's also going to be going up to $8,000 for the 2023 assessment year. That's the tax bill you'll pay in 2024. You do have to be 65 years of age or older have to own and occupy the property as of January 1st, very similar to the residential exemptions. You can apply any time during the year in which you turn 65. You don't have to wait until your birthday. But in order to apply for the exemption, we do have some requirements so that we can prove ownership. Uh, many people will say, well, doesn't the tax bill prove ownership? No, it doesn't. It just tells us who the taxpayer is. So we need to show proof of ownership, like a warranty deed, title policy, uh, anything that, that tells us that you are the owner of the, uh, of the property. If the property is held in a trust, we need to see a copy of the trust agreement. We also need to have something that shows that you are actually 65 years of age. Driver's license, birth certificate, passport, so that we can verify your age. This is the standard senior exemption. Again, it, as long as you own and occupy and you're 65, you'll have the opportunity to take advantage of that exemption. The next exemption that we have is what's called the Senior Citizen Tax Deferral. Uh, this one really amounts to a loan from the state of Illinois. Uh, it does it pay the state through a loan program, pays up to the first $5,000 in uh, tax dollars that are owed on the property. Uh, we call it a deferral. Uh, it is a loan against the property. The state will put a lien against the property, and, it, uh, and that comes at a 6% uh, interest rate. 
It does allow seniors to stay in their home. However, um, the last bullet point is, is, is kind of nice government speak. Deferred amounts must be repaid within one year of settlement of the estate or at the time the property is sold or otherwise transferred. Uh, the idea is, of course, once the senior would pass away, then the state would have to get paid its money back first. Uh, continuing on, uh, this exemption has a little bit different due date. Uh, this one is June 1st. You have to be 65 years of age by June 1st, as opposed to January 1st for the others. Uh, it does have an income limit of $55,000. Um, the, the homeowner has to own and occupy for uh, at least three years. No delinquent uh, taxes on the property, no special assessments. It has to have adequate insurance and so forth. Again, the state is loaning money on the property. They want to make sure that that asset will pay them back upon settlement of the estate. The next senior exemption, uh, second only to the actual senior exemption itself, is the senior freeze. This one is an income-based exemption. Uh, it is for the entire household. So the applying senior has to be 65 years of age and everybody in the household. The entire combined household income has to be $65,000 or less. Uh, once you get past that threshold, you wouldn't be eligible for the exemption. And it is for everybody's income in the home. We look at wages, interest, and dividend income, pensions, IRAs, the whole nine yards. Any form of income that you have, they're going to want to take a look at. Uh, this one has what we call the two January's uh, residency requirement. Uh, you do have to live in the property for two Januarys before you would be eligible to apply for the exemption. Again, if you're filing for 2022, which is the tax bill you pay next year, you'd have to be in the property for 21 and 22. Uh, you do need to prove the income. Of course, that would be your 1040s and any 1099s as well. But the senior freeze exemption can provide a lot of relief for those of you that are 65 and above. The next slide that will show you will give you an idea of how much people can save with just the senior freeze exemption. Uh, so if, if we start looking at a property that received the exemption back when it was first eligible in 2000, you can see that they would save quite a bit of money. I'll, I'll run through this part fairly quickly. So if they had the senior freeze exemption, they'd be paying a tax bill roughly about $3,900. Okay, and that's on a, on a value of freeze value here of about 75,000, so about 225,000 market. In last year, they would have paid about 3,800. The year before that, they right, right around 4,000. If they didn't have the senior exemption, they would have been anywhere from 9,000 to $9,600. So the exemption matters, and it matters a lot. Uh, one of the things that we do in our office is we help seniors fill out those exemption forms. All right. If you're not sure if you would be eligible for it, you're welcome to call the office. We'll be happy to. Uh, walk you through the process and the requirements for it. But you can see that it could, over time, save you quite a bit of money. Some of the other exemptions that we have, uh, this is just uh, more for informative purposes than, it, than anything. The persons with disability homestead exemption, veterans with disabilities, uh, there's specially adapted housing, and then also standard homestead exemption, and returning veterans homestead exemption. You're always welcome to call our office. We have information on those if you think you may be eligible. So, we talked about how the assessment's created. We talked about tax bills, but let's say you're still not happy. Okay? Nobody likes taxes. We all know that. Okay? So, once the tax bill is issued, what, you, what can you do? And there's not a lot that we can do at that point in time, but we can start looking forward from that tax bill. Right now, tax bills are out and in your hands. The next installment will be due in the uh, first part of September. We can't go back and do anything to that value, but we can look forward to tw the 2022 assessment, which is the bill you'll pay next year. And if you don't agree with our valuation of the property, you can always file an assessment appeal. And that's where I'm going to step through some facts next. Again, um, we don't tax anybody in our office, but it is a significant part of the process. If you don't agree with the number that we've sent you, either through the mail or in the newspaper, you can file an appeal. 
while filing the appeal, strictly speaking, is not the same thing as appealing your taxes, one does relate to the other. Getting a, a lower assessment white might well mean a lower tax bill, but if your decrease in your assessment is lower than the increase in the tax rates, you could actually see an increase in your tax bill. So it can happen, but the first place to start with, of course, is the assessment. Uh, as I've mentioned before, we, uh, our data value is January 1st. We're right in the middle right now of completing our work. Uh, statutorily, we have to have our work finished no later than November 15th. Once we complete our work, we turn our assessment rolls or the books over to the Supervisor of Assessments Office in Wheaton, and they review our uh, assessment role to determine whether or not we've gotten to that level of assessment we need to be at. Once that review is completed, the notices are mailed and we publish in the newspaper. So you don't like your assessment. So what can you do? The first thing we want you to do is come to us. And our, our office exists to serve the public, and the first thing that we want you to do is come to us with your informal appeal. Uh, 2019, we started an informal appeal process through our website. It's called the Assessment Inquiry Forum. It's your first opportunity without going through the formal process to help, help us help you understand your assessment. You can speak with the staff regarding your assessment. What we want to do on that first initial contact would be verify the accuracy of the data. Do we have the square footage right? Do we have the age right? Do we have the number of bedrooms? All of the stuff that's on your property, we want to make sure we're right. As Assessor Wilkins mentioned, there's 46,000 parcels in the township. Occasionally, occasionally, <laughs> we get it wrong. <laughs> Not as much as we'd like to think, but... Emphasize occasionally. Occasionally. One, one, one more time, occasionally. Yeah. So the idea is that there, errors are going to occur. So we want that first contact to be, is our property data correct? Are you receiving the exemptions you're supposed to get? Okay. Those two things right there can mean meaningful relief on your, on your tax bill. If we've checked the record and we find it to be accurate, if you're receiving all of the, inf or all of the exemptions that you're entitled to, then we are going to ask you, what's the basis for the appeal? Why are you here? And there's a couple different ways you can file. The first one is uh, what we call a, a sale or a value appeal. Um, if you've recently purchased the property, uh, let's say within the last year, and our number's higher than what you paid for it, let us know. We will verify the sale, make sure that it meets the definition of market value, and we'll look at ma uh, making relief. The next one could be maybe you've had the house appraised recently. Uh, typically in an up market like this, people are getting home improvement loans. So they've gone out and they've gotten a, uh, gotten a refi loan some, or a refi appraisal, something like that. Bring that information to us. On refinance appraisals, we'll take a look at those. We typically adjust them to the market, but give us that information. We're always happy to take information. The more data for us is the better. It makes for a more accurate assessment. Uh, if you did actually want to go out and get your home appraised, that $350 fee, probably up to about $400, $450 now, you'd have to decide for yourself if paying that money is worth whatever kind of relief you might make on your tax bill. Uh, I always tell most homeowners that it's always worth it because if nothing else, you'll have a good idea what your property's worth from a second source outside of our office. The other means by which you can file an appeal is what's called an equity or uniformity argument. Now I have roughly, uh, not including the staff, I have about seven people here in the room. Let's say we lived in a block where every single house was the same. Everybody's house was all the same. And one person, who wants to raise, somebody raise your hand. Can't be anybody in the back row. This, this young, young man, what's your name, sir? Al. Al. Al's gone along and he's looked in the newspaper and everybody's house is at $100,000 assessed and Al's sitting at $150,000. There's something there that's not right. If everybody's got the same home, your assessment should be like everybody else's. That would be what's called an equity or uniformity complaint. You present information that says, this isn't right in terms of what everybody like me is. And we could look at reviewing the assessment at that time. Uh, you'll notice there I put it's the most time intensive for the homeowner. Uh, the sales information, if you're paying for an appraisal, somebody else is doing the work. Uh, if you've recently purchased it, it's fairly straightforward. 
But if you're going to do an equity appeal, it's walking the neighborhood, looking for houses like yours, writing their addresses down, going to our website, looking at their assessments. It's fairly time intensive. Uh, most people, I suggest, you know what? That's a good time to go ahead and look at, write those addresses down while you're walking the dog. Because you're going to know what houses look like yours. And once you go to our website, you can look at their assessments compared to yours. This is all the informal appeal process. You've done the work, Al, you've come to us and you said, you know what, this is what I got. And our office says, you know what, we cannot change the assessment at this time. And you can always move to the formal appeal process. The formal appeal process, exactly like the name says, now you're presenting your information to a deciding body. In this case, the DuPage County Board of Review. You'll have the opportunity to present your information. Uh, it can be the same information you presented to our office but you're going to have that opportunity to present the information to an impartial third party. <clears throat> Just as before, if you've recently purchased the house, if you have a recent refinance appraisal of the property, all of those things are data that you can use at the, at the formal appeal. The appeal form itself for the Board of Review is two pages, fairly straightforward. On the first page, it asks for some basic information, property address, owner name, You'll see right in the middle, it asks you what you think the value of your property should be. Okay? That's our job. We want to know what you think the property is worth. And then the second page is your opportunity to tell us which homes you're comparing yours to. It does require a minimum of three. Anyone one far too far? It does require a minimum of three, no more than five, because the hearing itself is only about 15 minutes. And you don't have a lot of time to get too far into your data. Uh, and we look for things like, uh, again, the number of square footage, when did it sell, does it have a, a basement, all of those things that make up property values, you'd be listing those here for your sales. So it's, it's fairly involved. You can fill this out online on the Board of Review's website. You do have to print it off and mail it, though. You can't submit it through the web because they use that postmark date as the date of filing. So you presented your evidence to our office, we can't make a change to the assessment. You presented your evidence to the Board of Review, and the Board of Review doesn't make a change to the assessment. So you do have one more bite at the apple, and that's called the Property Tax Appeal Board. This is a body that sends hearing officers to the county from Springfield, and at this time, you're presenting either the same information or new information, whichever you prefer. <clears throat> you're going to give the, the, the hearing officer, whether it's a market value appeal, did you recently purchase the house, is it an equity appeal, is your assessment unlike others, you can give all of that information to the property tax appeal board. Same thing, you can fill out the forms online, but they do need to be mailed through the mail because they use the postmark as the filing date. When you do file with the property tax appeal board, See, this is 2022, what are we going through, 2019 hearings right now? Yeah. Yeah. So we're a few years behind because the state has to hear all of the 102 counties in the entire state. So they are a little bit behind where we would be uh, doing our assessments. So that's the thumbnail sketch in record time of how we do things. Uh, but I do want to I do want to reiterate, uh, Assessor Wilkins has made an office that's very accessible to the public. We're always willing to answer questions and we welcome those questions from you. However we can, we are more than welcome to help. Uh, and with that, I have my last slide here. Thank you for attending. And then I hand this over to you. Thank you, Representative. Thank you. We appreciate that. Um, so don't, oh no, don't go anywhere because if, if you may, um, I'd like, I'd like to, you know, I don't know if anyone in the audience would like to start off by asking questions. I actually have a few um, that I know have come up in some other uh, tax appeal forums if you're interested in answering them. Um, one of the questions that comes up is if I file an appeal, what is the likely success rate uh, when it comes to either York Township or DuPage County? I don't know if any if you either have those statistics or... <laughs> well, and Julie is the one who does Elmhurst personally. So if you have any questions, we can ask Julie. So um, I would have to say that if you come to me directly, call me into the office, I usually work with homeowners. Very rarely do I send a homeowner on to the Board of Review. We usually can come
come to some agreement if you got good information. Um, not scary to work with. <laughs> I don't know if I've worked with any of you people or not, but um, but I don't know if there's a likelihood. I mean, people think that you have to hire an attorney to get a, to get a more favorable decision or something. You really don't. If you just have the right information, you know, we're like I said, we're very easy to work with. Um, one of the uh, issues as well is, you know, the importance of the notice is really critical if somebody does want to challenge their valuation. Yeah. What's something that people should be on the lookout for? What's the approximate time frame when people should be looking for these notices in the mail and not thinking, oh, here's a random envelope, let me toss that, thinking it's junk mail or something like that? We have to close our books of November 15th but it's always posted on our website. This year we're looking at sometime around August to close our books, but it it depends what we have to do that year as to when we close them. We just have to have them closed by November 15th. So just keep checking our website, www.yorkassessor.com, or just give us a call and we'll be happy to let you know. My guess is that September will be the start of the year. If we close at the end of August, it takes two weeks for the county to process everything and get out the notices. So probably around mid-September, definitely. And, and what do those notices actually look like so that people can be on the lookout for them in the mail? Um, it's only going to be the ones that changed in value. Right. So not everyone gets one in 2022. As Jerry said, in 2023, everyone will get one. Um, it just shows it'll come from DuPage County Supervisor Assessment's office, and it'll show what the 2021 assessment was and what the revised 20. 22 assessment. Is it usually a letter, a postcard? It's a letter. It's a letter. Okay. But keeping in mind, you can always call our office because we always, we will speak to anyone at any point in the year. I, we have the soft appeals and so they always go ahead. And I usually talk to about the same homeowners call every year. And I don't <laughs> mind talking to people, believe me, they call every year. So I tell, I usually tell everybody, usually call me that first week in August and then I can give you a better idea of when we're going to close our books at our office. Because it could be the end of September, it could be November, but usually by August we have a little bit better idea. Because on the years that you're not going to get a notice, it's going to be in the newspaper, but not every home is going to be in there if you didn't do anything to your home. So if you do have the newspaper and you see people's parcels in there, it's another trigger for you to know that it's time for the appeals, it's time for that 30 day notice, even though your number is not in there, you can still appeal. So here in the northern part of the district, both Elmhurst and Oak Brook, we, we're seeing more and more homeowners associations being formed. What's something that homeowners associations can do to try to be proactive when it comes to either the, all of their residents or just in terms of getting some of the market value to make sure that there is uniformity in the assessment process? Go ahead. <laughs> well, the first thing to do is, is come, come in and ask, you can ask for your neighbor, individual neighborhood, you can, We'll print out something that shows all the sales and the assessments. We're not trying to hide anything, so we can show you everything uh, in terms of value, in terms of assessment per square foot, and all those things. And if it's condos and townhouses, we have them uniform across the board. So, would, in a condo building, would, would everyone is the same size, would everybody's assessment be the same? So, if they're not, then that would be. Unless they, they have some changes. Yeah, the uh, condos and townhomes are valued by model type. So we would look at all of the models, find out a median selling price for that model type. And then all of the same models would be assessed alike. Median. At the median, correct. Yeah. So that means 50% of them are going to be above that sale point, 50% will be, 50 will be low, below that sale point, but we pick that midpoint and all of the same models would be assessed alike. Um, now, one uh, question, one thing that uh, Assessor Wilkins and I were talking about is, you know, because we've had a lot of fluctuation in the housing market, and, and she's certainly been through it many times, where the housing market goes up, the housing market goes down. Sometimes people say the value of my house went down, but my assessed value went up. Can you explain how you guys try to deal with those types of markets, and if there's anything homeowners could proactively do when you're in the middle of those types of Markets. I would say a declining market because nobody but should be filing an appeal when that happened, increasing market. It happened in 08 where the markets were really hot and then it went down. We, ha we have to use the last three years of sales. So it could be where the end of the roller coaster is still high where the market is low. But keeping in mind the tax rate, so it's 
the levy is divided by the assessment equals the tax rate, so it's like a teeter-totter. So if the assessments go up, the tax rate goes down. And it just goes back and forth like that. So there's really not much we can do because we have to follow the law and it's the last three years of sales. But if you're in that type of market, would you say it's probably the homeowner's benefit if they're in a declining market to try to file those appeals every try year to, to get that? Try to file the appeals, call our office, you can always get an appraisal because we have to go by the appraisals, so that would help also. One other tip, if you're in a declining market, we have to use three years worth of sales. When you fill out your comps on the appeals, use the most current year. The sales, like if, if it's 2022 and the market's declined, it's been declining, you wouldn't want to use a sale from 2018 if it was higher. You'd want to use the 2021 sales because those will be lower in a declining market. Kind of like the same thing right now. Elmhurst is a very hot market. It has been for for a few months now, as you know. So these ranch houses, let's say a 1,200 square foot ranch houses are giving a big bucks in the, in the marketplace. So you don't want to use those really, the sales that are coming in real high right now, you might want to be using sales from 2020 or 2019. You know, we have to go by three years, so I do have to still include them in my sales ratio study, but you never, so in a, in a upturn market, you don't necessarily have to use just that year. But I have to look at all three years. Yeah, so use the lowest year sales. Whatever sales, the lowest that's what you want to try. Well, w w within reason, though. I mean, you know, I mean that. that well, no, I mean that was that was one of the things, right? If you're living, if you're living in a twelve, uh, if you're living in a uh, five thousand square foot house, don't use a twelve hundred square Correct. foot ranch. Correct. Yeah. No, you wouldn't <laughs> use that. Um, but along those lines, you know, uh, Jerry, you mentioned the the you know the equity in terms of uniformity and that type of thing. So maybe you are wandering around walking the dog, and you're like, well, wow, that house looks like mine but you know, their property tax bill is higher or lower, that type of thing. What type of evidence tends to be most persuasive in the assessor's office to say, this one is more like mine versus maybe some other one that the office used as a comp? Uh, and, and typically what we're gonna do is, uh, we're gonna look for those homes that would be most similar to yours. So to use the 1,200 square foot brick ranch versus the 5,000 square foot home, those don't move in the same market. They don't have the same buyers and sellers. So we're going to look for homes that are most like the home being appealed. And that's what you would want to do as well. If you have that 1,200 square foot ranch, you're going to be looking for ranch style homes. If you, you're certainly not going to know how big they are from the street. That's why I said you write down an address, you go back to our website. You can pull up all that information. Uh, it, it, in addition to the property specific information, there's also a link there, you click on that, it's going to give you all of the sales of similar homes in your neighborhood. So all of that information will be there and available for you. Uh, but we do want to have something that's as similar as we can get, because that's what we're going to look for. We would ask the homeowner that's filing the appeal to do the same thing, try and apple to apple. Right, so for example, even here in Elmhurst, you wouldn't, if you live in the city center type area, you wouldn't say, you're, you're, the assessor's office isn't going to find maybe an appraisal from North Elmhurst or South Elmhurst or a different school district. You've got to try to get as similar as you can to your own. Um, in, the, in the past, are there any other things, you know, either number of bathrooms, square footage, age of home, condition of home uh, that you found can maybe you know, tip the scales a bit on the uniformity question. We're going to give it to Joe. Yeah, so, so each of those amenities in your home does add a, like a line item value to your house. So yes, if you have a house, and let's go back to the 1200 square foot ranch house, they have two bathrooms, but the house next door has one and a half bath, they should be charged a little bit more for that extra half bath. Or they have a one car garage, and this one has a three car garage. You know, each one of those kind of amenities does have a line item that I print out for all homeowners to see so that they can see that like I'm comparative to this house but they're getting charged maybe they have a fireplace and you don't so there are those things those amenities that will be charged more for your home and that's according to what the state looks at as an accessible feature. Now what about something say somebody's just remodeled their kitchen and maybe they have super fancy cabinets and you've got you know normal Home Depot, you know, cheap cabinets. Like, you know, how does that factor okay. into the assessed value at so all? So we're not going into every home, so we don't know what's in your home. So you could have done your house without going any further. 
permits and somebody else could have totally rehabbed their house. I am going to be creating a new category in 2023 with these rehab homes just because if you know in Elmhurst you have these, uh, let's go back to that 1200 square foot range, selling for $300,000, they, somebody came in and rehabbed it, flipped it, and sold it for six fifty. dollars you know, that's happening a lot. So this has to be a new category and that has to be considered a whole new sales ratio for those rehab house because you know, if you have somebody living in this house that I haven't done any work to, I don't want to be compared to that $650,000 house. So I am making a differential there between those houses. And again, we can talk about that if you feel like you have comps and you're saying that you don't have any, you haven't done any work in your house, then talk to me and see what I have other comparables for you. I want to make one other point, uh, a tip. If you're filing with us or the Board of Review, equity is a pretty good argument. We will look at equity. If you're filing with the Property Tax Appeal Board before the state of Illinois, the burden of proof for equity is much more difficult than filing on market value. So it's harder to win an equity case before the state of Illinois. All right. Because we have to show statistical equity. So if you have some lower and we have some higher, that meets their standard and they won't lower it. Sure, go ahead. Can you describe equity in terms of you're using it? I think equity is, I bought a house for $750,000, I paid off $575,000. This is equity in my mind. That is <laughs> equity is you to go back to the 1,200 square foot ranches. Mm -hmm. What the county, what we do, what the state will do is say, let's say the building assessment was fifty thousand. They're going to divide fifty thousand by that twelve hundred square feet and get a building assessment per square foot. And they're going to see if yours falls within the range of the other building assessments per so square foot. Equity is the Equal. Yeah, so so one, one way to think about it would be if, you know, here in Elmhurst, we do have a lot of houses that were built in the you know, 1940s, 1950s era, and they're, they're pretty similar to one another. Well, if you have one that still has all of its original vintage tile and cabinetry and that type of stuff, it will probably have a lower market value as compared to one where a rehabber has gone through, gutted everything, so you've got new kitchen, new stove, new refrigerator, new bathrooms. So that's one of those instances where, you know, if you can even pull it up on Zillow, right, and say, okay, look, that one was completely rehabbed. The house that I live in still has the 1950s, you know, particle board cabinets. My, my value is not going to be the same as that one. So that's, I think, what, what they kind of get at in terms of equity. It's like, yeah, that's true. We're not going to say that your home value is going to have an equal value, you know, fair market value compared to the one that's already been gutted and rehabbed. Same thing if you've got like an unfinished basement versus somebody who's gone through and done a finished basement, right? Because the finished basement is going to be perceived as more livable square footage, whereas the unfinished basement you know, that, that's going to be perceived as something that's not adding as much value to the home. When were you going to start with the new? Uh, for the new, that new remodel rehab yeah. category, it's going to be in 2023. So I'm doing this whole year worth of work. I mean, I'm doing, I've got like over 600 houses already in that category. But I mean, I know I have to keep putting more in there, but I'm seeing it more and more happen. So I've gone back since 2019. So anytime somebody took out a permit, for let's say a general remodel for $80,000 or more, I'm actually pulling the blueprints and seeing if they've actually like rehabbed that whole house. You know, and then I'm gonna just put it in a category of an R, even if it hasn't sold. The selling ones, it's easier to find those because I've been looking on, you know, Zillow Red Pen, because I'm not going in. So this will be next year that this will actually be in twenty twenty three. His homeowners will see the effect. In, for those remodeled rehabs, yes. And that's for taxes paid. Payable 24. Correct. Yes. Taxes are always paid in the arrears. And actually, can you explain what, you know, 2023, because it's going to be a general reassessment year, what that means for everybody and why every homeowner should care every about that. Every should care. So in 2023, um, with the, like, 11,000 parcels that I had in Elmhurst, there's 33 different neighborhoods. So in each neighborhood, I will go through it every home individually. So I'm going to look at all the ranch houses in neighborhood 0111, which is by like uh, York Road, 3rd Street, um, like in that area, they're off to the railroad tracks. 
So I can look at all the ranch houses there. I'm going to look at all the one and a half stories, all the split levels, all the bungalows, and each one is going to have its own category to specific style. And then I'll look at all the sales for those. So then you'll get a notice. And based on the sales that are occurring, your assessment is either going to go up or it could possibly go down. Could be that, let's say, I've made an agreement with your neighbor and their assessment then in 2023, maybe their assessment is going to go increase, but yours only, yours went decreased. So it's just going to depend on where the assessments start in 2022 to where they're going to have to go in 2023. So some people go up, some people might go down, and some people might stay the same. So go ahead, Amy. The market's gone up so much in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Should people anticipate general upward swing? Or does it get like sort of get adjusted to the budget needs of the well, that's a good question. So I think that that's why we use the three-year median. So with the sales coming in in 2019, we're not as high as the sales in 2021, early part of 2022. We saw that the market increasing in Elmhurst there. I mean, I think the market's been pretty steady here, and you haven't seen it really fluctuate down. So with the three-year, it, it, it makes the adjustments for those up and downs in the market, because you're able to take all of it. So in 2019, Maybe that 1,200 square foot ranch sold for 275, and then it's still selling for 350 now or 425. So I have to be able to take all of those. And when we do a three year, you're looking at I could be looking at 40 ranch houses in one neighborhood that sold. So that gives me a good idea of the market of what's actually ha happening there for values for all the other ranch houses that aren't selling. So <laughs> well, let's do Kathy first, then we'll go back to Ann. In January, we received our assessment for supervisor assessment. So since this is not a general um, assessment year, that is the assessment that will be valid for next year's tax bill, right? Correct, for the tax bill, right? For the tax bill because we're taxing 2022. Correct. But we don't know yet what we'll get in January. Would, would it change on January 1st, 2023, if no one appealed, or? Um, well, are you in a condo or a time? I am. Yeah, so uh, Jerry, then you let me take that. The, I uh, oh, the, the data value is always January 1st, as has been spoken to. We try to complete our work around the end of the summer, which means that, uh, uh, as has been spoken to, if you give us a call around the first week in August, we're going to know, we'll have a better idea when we'll close which would mean we'd have a better idea when you would get your notice if we changed your assessment. Oh, okay. uh, that, that publication date, that notice, is when it starts the filing period. Um, if you don't file and if there aren't any other changes uh, across the entire township, then that assessment notice that you received is the, the dollar value that your tax bill would be based on the following year. Okay. So if we don't get anything, then it means we didn't change your assessment. And, and normally, if somebody's in a condo, you're probably not going to change their assessment unless a building permit is pulled to actually change something to Yeah, the condo. yeah. condos, generally speaking, I, I, I was mm -hmm. having this discussion with Assessor Wilkins this morning. I've always said condos are easy because models A, A's are valued this way, model B's are valued this way, model and so forth. Um, the only reason to change them would be sales. Uh, we are starting to see some condos that are doing rehab work, and that's going to be reflected in the sale prices. So that's how we make our changes. All right, back to Anna. And may I build on that point to sure. learn more? So I live in a FDU, and the units in the lower level floor, and the units above in the same staff are similar, mm -hmm. may have sold for 30 to 50 percent more because they have a view, they perhaps a lot more initial upgrades in this new building. So it was challenging for me to see assessments, you know, several floors up, there were much higher price point sales, mm -hmm. similar or the same as my own, where I paid a lot lower and anticipated paying based on the price. Mm -hmm. Can you help understand, explain the logic of that in general? Sure. Uh, the, the simpler, straightforward answer is we're looking to make it as simple as we can in the assessment process. Uh, the market may recognize those differences in you know, dollar values based on, on the floor position. Uh, all for what we do, all of those sales get lumped in the same hopper, and then I pick that midpoint sale for all those models. 
Um, as I said before, that means 50% of the models are going to be higher than that midpoint, 50% are going to be lower. It's considered to be the most equitable way to do it because, again, everybody will be either 50% above, 50% below. Uh, as, as happens, unless you're downtown, uh, as time goes by, those floor differences and values tend to uh, mediate themselves pretty well. Uh, you really do only see it as your, your builders are, are offering them in the marketplace. But to keep the process straightforward, it's just everybody in the same hopper and, it, and we pick a midpoint. <clears throat> but if there has been a change, so for example, maybe if, you know, uh, Maybe you, your view gets blocked, or you have you know, something that could actually impair the market value relative to some of the other units. Is that a situation where someone could come in and make that equity argument to the assessor's office if they can back it up with data and evidence? And that's the key, is the data and evidence. Um, one, one property does not an, uh, a comparable make if I have a sufficient amount of evidence that, that could point to that. I would I would certainly look at it. I would, I would ask successful workers to look at it. And we look at statistical things as well, like coefficient of dispersion. So if the if the dispersion of, from the sales from that median start to get too far out, like the, you said, the ones on the seventh floor sold for a lot higher than this level. So if we had too much dispersion from that median, mm -hmm. then we would might we would maybe look at the seventh floor versus the first floor. When those, when the range of dispersion got too great, we might make an adjustment then. We probably would make. Yeah. When condo units are first built and sold, mm -hmm. it's sold on location and stuff. But as it goes on further on down the road, like 10 to 15 years, and somebody wants to live in that condo, they don't really have a choice whether they're on the sixth floor or the first floor if they want to live in the condo building. It's just what's available. So it really goes back to the law of supply and demand of it's they're going to get what they get because that's what's available. That makes sense. But 10, 15 years of paying higher in this is a bit of time. I think uh, you're, you're going to be getting a visit at the assessor's <laughs> office and you know maybe some evidence plus, placed in there. So, um, all right, I want to make sure that, you, sorry, you're in the back. I just one quick question. Um, as far as teardowns go, mm -hmm. I've got a 930 square foot house. I cannot find, there's no lot. Right, so if you feel like your house is assessed, I would, and if you feel that your house is a teardown and you're in a neighborhood that has a lot of teardowns, I would use other like houses that sold as a lot value. So even though you have a, let's say a one and a half story home that they tore down and paid 350 for the lot, and let's say on your street, because there is a lot of streets that are to a lot of teardowns lately, um, you know, you can just start listing about those. And especially some people have even come in to me with like, I've been, uh, you know, um, addressed by a builder, you know, they want to offer me this. You know, show me that kind of information too. I don't mind looking at houses if it's a teardown. Again, it's a small house and right now the, what would, I, what would you call it, Dude, probably your, your highest and best use would be a teardown for that property, for the land. Okay, so I can go out and ask the question because before it was always you had to compare right. the same style. Mm -hmm. So in that kind of situation, you would consider I would look at it definitely. Lot size. Yeah. Okay. Lot size. Lot size. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Go ahead. Have you ever received an appeal or a request, not an appeal, a, a request for adjustment uh -huh. you know, when you run and uh, raised it, realized you weren't high enough? Yes, that can happen. <laughs> My lawyer told me, don't even do this. Okay, right. Because I have a 22 year old house and it's surrounded by, the, apparently, we're like in the French province of before the revolution, where he's back to the great of the next. And, you know, I had a 3,200 square foot house surrounded by similar size houses that had $400,000 of fixtures. And, okay. and he's like, just don't even bother. Yeah. Don't even bother and don't even ask it. You might turn around and be told to go more. Personally, I've never like gone to raise people and I don't like to threaten people to say you could get raised, but it is a possibility that the Board of Review could raise you once they're looking at evidence. Mm -hmm. 
you know, if you're saying that you have, a, you know, houses that you want to... But I mean, because mine's still all original cabinets, no finished basement, no, I mean... Right. In no way and would somebody can... come to buy my house if they were looking for these other houses that are right next door. Yeah. Um, and, and, and when it was built, I'm sure it was the biggest house in the block, but it's, you know, did they moved on to other things. Did you say your house was 22 years old? Yeah. So that 1990 to like the 2000, that age houses I know have come down like dramatically in pricing because those are going to need to be like rehabbed almost again, redone again. So I am looking at that age group also. So it would be... I have seen it here now. So finally an appeal or a request for that, I guess I'm using the wrong word, yeah. I'm sorry. No. Um, so would be worthwhile to do that if you're in that... If you're in that age group and then you want to use comps that are also in those age homes too. Which is another problem because how do you find that? How far away from that property can you go? To Depending find on where where you're situated, like where where is your house at? It's um, down by Jefferson School and uh, you know, like between that train track that's South Jefferson, yeah. mm -hmm. St. Charles, York, and tonight. Okay, so you're you're probably gonna go like you're gonna still stay in that that whole area there, but still just look for houses built in 1990. Like like Jerry was saying, when you're going out walking around the neighborhood, mm -hmm. just say like, oh yeah, that kind of looks like my house. Look it up on the website, and you'll see. Okay, that was built in 1996. That's a comp that I want to use. But what if no one else is, what if, what if everybody else is stuck in that? You know what I'm saying? Like, I bought it, like, eight years ago. Right. But there it wasn't so much the case then, but it is absolutely now. Yeah, so you want to look for sales case. of those. So yes. even talk to realtors in the neighborhood. There's okay. a lot of realtors that do help out when it's the time for the assessment appeal. Um, I tell them to call a lot of people. There's Mike Mazinga, there's, yeah, there's, all, <laughs> there's yeah. a lot of yeah. If I can, uh, you know, when I mentioned before about getting an appraisal, I always, I always recommend people talk to their realtors first. That's your jumping off point. A realtor's going to do a broker price opinion, and they're going to come back with a number, and you can look at that versus your assessment and say, okay, now do I want to pay the $350, $400, $500 for an appraisal if I've got evidence that's pretty close to where the assessor is? Mm -hmm. Whereas if the Broker price opinion comes back and it's considerably lower than where the assessor's office is, it may be worth your while to pay the money for the appraisal. Is a realtor motivated to always try to get the highest realtors, appraisal though? Realtors are always looking for business. <laughs> always if, looking if, for if a realtor can convince you that you have a really high priced home that you might be able to, you know, move into something nicer for comparable values, they they will happily tell you that fact right so but one of the things though I think that you can you know kind of do in terms of legwork and again their website is really helpful is when you you know put in your address look at all the criteria that the assessor's office has for your house so one of the areas where sometimes people actually will and so I'm not gonna put them on the spot where people will sometimes get a higher assessed value is maybe the assessor's office thinks that you don't have an addition on the back and you don't have a fireplace and you don't have a finished basement and in reality you do right that's a situation where now if you go to the assessor's office and they oh do you have this do you have this and the answer is well yeah i do then all of a sudden you know it's because they didn't have the information about what the actual condition and of the house was right, right. I'm talking yeah about yeah that doesn't have any yeah. Right, but what, what I would say is in terms of you know strategies and tactics, when you find out what their criteria is on the website, turn, then, then that's the point where you'll want to see, okay, what other houses are in my neighborhood that have you know 3,000 square feet, were built in the 1990s, then that's where I think Zillow and Redfin and that kind of thing can be your friend because even if there's been a more recent sale, you can still look to see at the time of that sale, did it have fancy new cab cabinets? Did it have refin you know, re-gutted re and redone bathrooms? Or is it still like, you know, the 1990s, like the, the, the what, you know, the light oak or something, you know, like some of the things that are no longer in style. Does it have oak trim instead of paint trim? You know, you can kind of get a sense of, has rehab work been done? And if yours hasn't, you know, that, that could be, okay, maybe it is then worth talking to a realtor or, you know, calling these guys up informally just to get a sense of, 
um, you know, where you are. And again, I, I just want to say that I found, um, the, you know, the York Township Assessor's Office, if you're in the southern part of the district and in Downers Grove uh, Township Office, these guys really do know the neighborhoods well. They really are here to try to be accurate. They don't get paid anymore if you're overvalued. They don't get paid anymore if you are undervalued. You know, their biggest incentive really is to try to get it right. And I, we're very lucky that we have people who are very, you know, honest, professional, um, making sure that, you know, the things are accurate. And, and yeah, and, you know, so, because it's not in their interest to be wrong, you know. Um, however, I will say, uh, so again, I want to make sure everybody has a chance to chat with the assessors. Any other questions? Yeah, Alan. Yeah, our business yeah. cards are up there. Okay, yeah. yeah. Did you work with Elmer? I'm Elmer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, it, so yeah. So, so actually, so Deanna, when someone calls into your office, Elmhurst, they should ask for ask Julie. For Julie. Yeah. Okay. And if they're in a townhouse or condo, ask for Jared. Ask for Jared. Okay. Yeah. If they're in Oakbrook, Judy Wolfman. Okay. And then, um, and Villa other... Park in Downers Grove is Judy Grillo, and then Lombard is Linda Trugler. Okay. So yeah. So hopefully you will have it covered. Um, so I did want to just you know. One of the things that does always come up is, yes, we have, you know, they, so they do the levy to actually get your assessed value correctly, your assessed value done correctly, but then, of course, the big question is, um, where does your money actually go? And this is a sample um, bill for Elmhurst, and again, if you look at, you know, Elmhurst, that it's pretty consistent in DuPage County, is roughly 70% of your property tax bill um, is made up of the schools, and some, you know, some districts is a little bit higher, um, but that's where your money goes. So I always tell everybody, if you are unhappy with your property tax bill, look at your municipal elections that usually occur in uh, the odd years um, after one of our general elections um, at either the state or presidential year because those are when your municipal officers get elected. Your aldermen, your school boards, that's when your property tax bill is usually uh, pretty much on the ballot, and those tend to be very low turnout elections. So that's an area where the more you vote, the, the more uh, impact you may be able to have on this. Um, another thing too that uh, we certainly see, uh, you can see this here with City of Elmhurst, uh, while the City of Elmhurst does not levy that much in terms of your property tax bill, um, you can see the pension fund actually is a huge expense for that. Now that doesn't mean that Elmhurst is um, you know, misspending, it's just that the city of Elmhurst has tried to do a lot to come up with other revenue sources to fund city operations, uh, not just rely solely on property taxes. So for them, local gov government distributive fund, which is a fund that's created at the state level, sales taxes is another huge source of um, your is local that revenue. Fund just for our city employees? Yep. Is that a nope, that, that's for our city employees. Um, and, and that's also going to include, you know, um, police fire, uh, that type of thing. Um, now, and this is, you know, there was a mention of Oak Brook. So Oak Brook, one of the reasons why they actually don't, they, they have traditionally have a lower percentage property tax bill is because Oak Brook Mall, uh, the village of Oak Brook has made a point of essentially saying, we are going to fund our village revenues off the sales taxes generated by Oak Brook Mall. So they do not actually do any levy uh, for, uh, for any of their uh, government services. However, I will say that unlike at the state level where our pensions have historically been underfunded, when it comes to our local pensions, uh, the, they're governed by the Illinois Municipal Retirement Fund for the most part. That is 94% uh, funded. We are probably the best, that, that one is probably the best statewide uh, pension system, actuarially sound, <laughs> properly funded, um, and you know, kudos to our local government members who really have tried to make sure that they are actually keeping up with their pension payments. Uh, not doing what has been the norm down in Springfield and doing pension holidays and, and getting behind. Um, and that actually is one of the things, if you look at the state funding, this is something that I always you know, try to make people aware of, is that um, an, an ever-increasing amount of our state budget is going to pension payments. So um, you know, when it comes to, it, it's teachers retirement, state employees, state universities, um, we do have one for the General Assembly. I don't take a pension from the General Assembly. Um, I refused it. Um, but for the most part, um, you know, a good chunk of your state budget, it's, you know, fiscal year 2023, 20, uh, 
we are spending more on pension payments than we are on Medicaid, Medicare, and more than we are on K through 12 education. So uh, the pension funding for the state of Illinois is also a really big deal and really does shape a lot of what you see um, in, in terms of the budget debates uh, downstate. But that's also why, um, from my perspective, we cannot, cannot, cannot skip those pension payments because if we do, um, they're just gonna keep swallowing up an ever bigger part of our state budget. Um, but ultimately, you know, Illinois, when it comes to the education funding in your schools, um, we actually have one of the largest administrative spends compared to our peer states. Um, one of the reasons why that happens is because of what I refer to as the unfunded mandates in Springfield. Uh, unfortunately, Springfield loves to tell our states, uh, our local schools how to operate, but then we don't actually give them the money to do all the pet projects that the legislators uh, put into place. So um, that drives administrative costs, compliance costs, and it's not dollars that are actually going into the classroom. Um, and you know, Jerry went through uh, these earlier, but yeah, in, in, for Illinois, um, when it comes to your uh, property taxes, property tax funding is pretty much how your schools are functioning and operating. Um, and when, when it comes to um, you know, our district um, and most districts, only about half of that is getting spent on instruction in the classroom. Uh, a, a lot of it just gets lost to um, administration and, uh, and other expenses. So with that, um, there was in 2019 an effort to try to do a property tax um, overhaul in the form of a property tax relief task force. Um, there were a whole host of different uh, potential legislative proposals that were put on the table. I think our caucus, we proposed 33 different reforms, um, you know, really trying to get at uh, what I think, you know, Deanna, uh, Wilk Assessor Wilkins talked about, you know, kind of this balancing act that you go through. Um, one of the things that, you know, in particular for seniors in terms of being able to stay in their homes is the value of their homes outstrips the, the ability of their income to uh, catch up and actually pay for those. So really it's one of the issues of what can we do to try to not just freeze the assessed value, which is uh, what the assessor talked about, but also freeze the levy. So Unfortunately, you know, in some states, the way in which property taxes work is you pay a certain percentage of the fair market value of your property. In Illinois, your taxing body decides how much money they want, and then it gets spread out over the value of the properties. So that's why, you know, we'll sometime, I'll sometimes get the question from people in the district, well, wait a minute, I have the senior tax freeze, why are my taxes still going up? The reason why they're still going up is because while your levy is, you know, your, your levied value at the assessor's office is the same, I'm sorry, the, the, the assessed value at the assessor's office is the same. Your taxing body has decided they want more money for the next fiscal year. So that's why your taxes are still continuing to go up. And while we have some uh, constraints in law, uh, there, there's actually not that many uh, to try to keep the, the taxes from going up. But if you do have ideas, if you do run into problems, we certainly encourage you to reach out to the office because again, a lot of these um, ideas that we were uh, that, that made their way into legislation did come from real world problems that people in our districts are facing when it comes to their property tax values going, their property tax um, levies going up and not just not being able to afford them. Um, so ultimately, I just want to say if there's any other questions that you have, um, I think all of us are gonna hang out informally if you uh, have any additional questions that you wanna ask us, but please, please, please do reach out to my office, reach out to Assessor Wilkins' office, or if you're in Downers Grove Township, to Assessor Boltz's office. They really are here to help and try to make sure that you can get things right because they, don't, they do wanna make sure that your assessed value is true and accurate so that you are not over, overpaying on your property tax bill. And with that, um, here's the contact information for Assessor Wilkins, as well as for me. Um, both of us have newsletters, so if you do want to sign up for our newsletters, um, you just email us. Uh, we've got the email addresses up there. Um, I believe they're also um, in your folders as well, our contact information. Um, but you know, definitely reach out, because we do want to make sure that we're hearing from you. And uh, to those of us who uh, are watching this online as well, um, the uh, email address for me is Mazaki, M-A-Z-Z-O-C-H-I, at ilhousegop.org. And you can also call the office at 630-852-8633. Um, again, we'll, we're, we are here, we are happy to help, and we do try to respond, um, hopefully within 24 to 48 hours. So with that, um, thank you uh, to Assessor Wilkins for being here. You know, you get Deanna and Deanna tonight. And uh, thank you very much for coming. Thanks, everybody.